How you doing? Oh, you're not supposed to laugh at that. You're supposed to respond to it with a, how you doing? How you doing? I'm doing pretty good, except for this tie around my neck. I had breakfast with Dr. Burgraff a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this week. And after our conversation, he asked me, he goes, do you own a tie? And I said, well, I bought some for this week. And um, in fact, um, you can have this if you want after chapel today. Each day, is you want to, your first one to come to me and say, hey, I'll have your tie. You can have my tie because I'll use them these three days and then you can be blessed with this thing. Someone said, preach it. Amen. Amen. I am absolutely, absolutely humbled and absolutely honored to be here today. I am very thankful, Dr. Stratton and Dr. Burgraff, for your very gracious invitation. And I'm also very excited about what God is doing here at this campus. And when I got the phone call this spring that at this school, there will be launched this year what this school is calling a metro mandate, obviously my heart was very excited. So it is my desire, my humble desire, to partner with the leadership of this school to instill a passion and a burden for the glory of God, which leads to a passion and a burden to take that glory of God through the gospel to people that need it the most. I'm humbled at the opportunity today because even this morning as I was fellowshipping with the Lord, I was reminded that I was once dead in transgressions and sins. That I was following the course of this world. That I was following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And I, like the rest of humankind, was under the just wrath of God. But God, who was rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved me, even when I was dead in my transgressions, he made me alive by grace unsaved. And he seated me in high places with Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show me the surpassing riches of grace in Christ Jesus. For by grace I have been saved through faith. It's not been my own doing. Not of works. I have nothing to boast about. I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that he has before ordained that I should walk in them. The only explanation as to why I'm here today is the miracle of the gospel. The only reason why you are here today, why there was a time in your life where you said, you know what, I want to go to a Christian college. It's because of the work of the gospel in your life. It's the only explanation. It's a miracle that you're here. It's a miracle that I'm here. And as we begin this week, it is my desire, not necessarily to, to drive us into urban missions, to drive us into a metro main date by guilty, by statistics that bring guilt. Like statistics like this that are true. That one third, almost one third of America's population of 300 million live in just nine metro areas. That today, over half of the world's population live in just 330 cities. That right now, it is estimated that over 155,000 people a day migrate from rural areas to cities. But it's not my desire necessarily to drive us into urban missions. It's not necessarily my desire to drive us into the metro mandate by statistics or by guilt. I want us to be driven by the gospel. And so, as I was speaking with Dr. Burgraff, the approach I want to take to our time together these next three days in chapel is to lay a theological foundation and allow that theological foundation to drive us to do, to attempt great things for God and to expect great things from God and specifically in the context of the city. The gospel defines us. And the gospel must drive us to attempt every God-magnifying thing. There are three truths. 
three truths that drive everything we do at Urban Imperatives. Urban Imperatives is a ministry that exists to motivate believers to become disciple makers and church planners in the cities of America. The three primary truths that drive us, very simple, the glory of God, the gospel, and the brevity of life. And so this morning, I want to begin by understanding that there is great profit in pondering our end. Let us approach the doctrine of the brevity of life. Let's pray together. Father, we bow our hearts before you now and ask for your blessing upon everything we attempt to do during these next moments. If you do not guide us, if you do not flood us with your sanctifying grace, if you do not open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your law, our time will be in vain. So may you come to us and help us. Thank you, Jesus, that you lived for us, died for us, rose for us, and sent us a helper. So may you, O Spirit of God, be our helper during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the days before autopsies, morticians, and funeral homes, a funeral service was being held for a woman who had just passed away. At the end of the service, the pallbearers are carrying out the casket when they accidentally bump into a wall, jarring the casket. As the casket bumped into the wall, they actually heard a faint moan. They opened the casket, and they found that the woman inside was still alive. She lived for ten more years, and then she died. A ceremony again is held in the very same place. And after this service was over, the very same pallbearers are carrying out the casket. And as the pallbearers are carrying out the casket, the husband of the departed cries out, Watch out for the walls! Not a very good testimony of a God-honoring marriage. But a strange occurrence nonetheless. And strange occurrences often happen at funerals. I think the strangest thing that happens at funerals, at least in my experience, has been whether it's at the funeral home or the church or maybe a reception afterwards, you find pockets of people gathered around talking about their own funeral. Conversations such as, this is the kind of casket that I would want. I'd want to be buried in these clothes. In fact, I like this picture board. These songs sung, you know what? We're not going to care. We're dead. But we have these conversations, and I admit I have. Maybe some of you have as well. Very strange. Very weird. Why is this the case? I believe it is a common human tendency to discuss these things that at events such as funerals, because God has built into the fabric of our being that we contemplate death at the death of another. It is by God's design that the death of another causes us to contemplate our very own end. And I would say this is not only by God's design, this is by God's design for our good. Listen to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. King Solomon said it's better to go to a funeral home than to a house party because when you go to a funeral home you begin to think one day I will be in a room like that. One day I will be in a casket like that. One day there will be people gathered around in a small room talking about my meager accomplishments in life. They will be talking about what I value. They will be talking about what I lived for. And when that happens, Solomon says we will lay it to heart. And thinking about that day will affect the way we live this day. There is great profit 
and pondering our end. Now, although there's great profit in laying this to heart, although there is great profit to, to thinking about our end, we do not like to do this. Matthew Henry speaks to this phenomenon. He says, The living know that they shall die, but few care for thinking of death. We have therefore need to pray that God, by His grace, would conquer that aversion which is in our corrupt hearts to the thoughts of death. He says, when we look upon death as a thing at a distance, we are tempted to adjourn the necessary preparations for it. But, when we consider how short life is, we shall see ourselves concerned to do what our hands find to do, not only with all our might, but with all possible expedition. As we consider our end, as we consider, as Matthew Henry says, the shortness of life. It should compel us not only to do what our hands find to do with all of our might, but with all possible expedition. To put it in modern day lingo, as we consider our end, it will compel us to get at it. Because life is so short. Life is so brief. So even though there is a level of morbidity, considering our end, even though it's a little unnerving and seems a little odd to think about it, it is wise for us to think about it, for it is in the thought of our end that God says we will begin to evaluate how we are living now. And as we, pr- as we ponder our end, it will compel us, it should compel us, to have a greater resolve not to waste our lives. I don't want to waste my life. Do you want to waste your life? I don't want to waste it. And I remember about three years ago when the thought struck me. A wasted life is something I want to avoid. But if we only think of it as a wasted life, then it doesn't really do anything for now. And then I began to think about this. A wasted life is made up of wasted years. Wasted years are made up of wasted months. Wasted months are made up of wasted weeks. Wasted weeks are made up of wasted days. Wasted days are made up of wasted hours. And wasted hours are made up of wasted minutes. And if I'm going to position myself not to waste this short life, thinking about that day when it will be all over, then I must commit myself to making each moment, each hour, each day, each week, each month, each year count for that which matters. Let us, as we consider this subject this morning, let's start on a very, very positive note. Let us celebrate that God is the sovereign giver of life. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a psalm that celebrates Aspects of God's glory that are unique to God Himself. Maybe in theology class, you've heard about attributes of God that are transferable. Attributes that I am required as one who has been made in the image of God to display through my life. Mercy, love, grace, holiness, righteousness, justice. But there are aspects of God's character that are not transferable, that we cannot ever attain. And Psalm 139 is a psalm that celebrates these aspects of God's character, the non-communicable attributes of God. For instance, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows our down-sittings and our uprisings. He knows our thoughts from afar. He knows the words that we will speak before they even roll off the tip of our tongue. That's amazing. God is omnipresent. He's at all places, at all times, in His entire being. The psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, you're there. And now in verses 13 through 17, we find another aspect of God's glory that's non-communicable, that is celebrated and marveled at. And it's that God alone creates human life. God alone creates human life. Verse 13. 
For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. The psalmist begins by marveling that his human body was formed and crafted by God. Now I take these references to God to be Trinitarian expressions because we know in Scripture that each member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, were all involved in the act of creation that's even embedded in the very first chapter of Scripture. But extensive biblical evidence moves us to believe that the primary agent in creation was none other than the Son of God. For we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning referencing Genesis chapter 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by Him, speaking of Christ, were all things created, that are in heaven, that are in earth, things visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him, by Christ, and for Christ. So I believe here in Psalm 139, we have our Savior forming and crafting the very bodies that He would one day die to redeem. The word form means to create, to fashion. The word inward parts refers specifically to kidneys, but in general it refers to our organs. So it was Christ who formed our organs, our veins, and our muscles. Everything on the inside that cannot be seen on the outside, Christ has seen and Christ has made. The word knitted indicates adoring our development in our mother's womb. Here is Christ weaving us together like a fine garment. If something is there and works right, Christ knitted it to work right. If there's something there that doesn't work right, like my son Silas's right ear, which is completely deaf, Christ formed it to be that way. He is the sovereign creator of all life. What should this do? According to verse 14, it should solicit from our hearts wonder, praise, and celebration. Verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Do you know that very well? That you were intentionally and personally crafted by God. You are the way you are because God made you to be the way you are. Don't be frustrated that you're not as tall as me. Don't be frustrated if you're as short as Dr. Burgraff. Don't be frustrated with the size of your nose. Listen, I've got a lot to be frustrated about if there's something to be frustrated about. You were made by God the way you are. Christ designed you. Christ crafted you. And as we look in the mirror in the morning, and some of us need to look a lot longer, that's why I shaved my head. I don't got to worry about that stuff anymore, okay? I look in the mirror, the first thing I should honestly think about is not me. I should think this. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful. Marvelous are the works of God. Verse 16 acts as a very strong and convincing argument against abortion as the psalmist marvels at God seeing his unformed substance, which literally means an embryo. But where I really want to drive our attention right now is the end of verse 16. The psalmist wants us to know that our bodies are not the only thing formed by God. Our lives are not the only thing formed by God. Notice the end of verse 16. He says, in your book were written, every one of them, was to them, the days that were formed for the days that were created for me. 
God has formed our days. So we see here that God is not only the sovereign giver of life, but God is also the sovereign ender of life. The God who formed our bodies is also the one who formed how many days we will live in these bodies. The heart that He formed to pump blood throughout our bodies was also formed to stop pumping blood throughout our bodies on a certain day. A day that was formed for me. Listen as Job marvels at God being the sovereign giver and ender of life in chapter 12, verse 10 of the book entitled Job. In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. He is the source. In chapter 12, verse 10. But then in chapter 14, verse 5, listen to the words of Job. His days are determined. And the number of his months is with you. And you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. Here's how remarkably and utterly sovereign God is. He has determined the beginning. Let's make it personal. He has determined our beginning. And He has determined our ending. This informs us that when our final day comes, when we breathe our last breath, whatever the human cause may be, whether it is disease or old age or cancer or a heart attack or a car accident or a natural disaster, or war, or martyrdom, whatever the human cause, God is the ultimate one who decides when our lives will end. Therefore, David says in Psalm 31, verse 15, my times are in His hands. So God wants us to know that there is an appointed beginning, and there is an appointed ending, And he also wants us to know that at its very best, that which is in between is brief and vapor-like. The beginning and ending and a very brief in between. That is why we find tons of scripture strewn throughout all of the Bible that points us to the reality that life is short. God is the sovereign giver, and He is the sovereign ender of life, and that which is in between is relatively short. So we have all these pictures for us in Scripture that depict for us, through symbolism, how short life really is. For example, the duration of life is likened to a passing shadow. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15, our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. In Job chapter 8, verse 9, for we are but of yesterday and know nothing, for our days on earth are a shadow. Psalm 102, verse 11, my days are like an evening shadow. Now this reminds me of experiences that I had as a chubby junior hire. I used to be short and chubby. I remember at night in our block of row homes in North Philly that when it got dark, the telephone light pole lights would go on. And what was interesting about the block that I lived on is that all the houses were connected and they all had these patios that protruded from the house. And as I walked up my street, my shadow was cast from the light on the pole onto the patio beside me. Now, this was a great there was a great way for me to boost my self-esteem as a chubby junior hire because I would race my shadow up the block. I know, I'm an idiot. So I would race my shadow up the block, and if I went the right way, I would always beat my shadow. But pretty soon, it wouldn't be night anymore. And those particular lights would go out. And that particular shadow on the patio would be gone. And God says that's what life is like. A passing shadow. So the next time you're walking through your house or your dorm or the gym or the lunch hall and you see your shadow come and you see your shadow go, that is a sovereign reminder from God. That's how brief life is. The duration of life is likened to a breath. 
In Psalm 144, verse 4, man is like a breath. You go outside in the winter, maybe not down here, but you go outside in the winter in Philadelphia and you take a deep breath and you exhale and if you have good hygiene, you see this cloud of white. It may be green for some of you. You see this cloud of white. And no, no sooner does it pass six inches from your face, it's gone. When you do that this winter, when you go home at winter break, And you go outside, and if you're from an area where it's cold, and you see your breath come, and you see your breath go, be reminded that that is a sovereign grace from God to remind us that life is short. Let's not waste it. James chapter 4, verse 14. What is your life? For you are a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Duration of life is also likened to a fast runner. In Job chapter 9, verse 25. My days are like a swift runner. They flee away. The duration of life is also likened to a praying eagle. In Job chapter 9, verse 26, My days go by like an eagle swooping on the prey. Just like the eagles swept down and obliterated the Detroit Lions yesterday. Okay, maybe that's a stretch. Sorry, Dr. McGrath. I've never seen an eagle swoop down and catch its prey. But I have seen a hawk swoop down and catch its prey. In fact, hawks were very good at maintaining the squirrel population at my Christian college. And I remember some of my most remarkable memories as a college student was watching a hawk take out a chipmunk in the open field. Here's Mr. Squirrel just traipsing around the grassy knoll. And then here comes this hawk and swam picks that baby up with its talons, goes up into the tree, and we would stand there and watch like a bunch of mesmerized morons as this hawk devoured this squirrel or chipmunk. If you ever see that happen, be reminded that's how short life is. The duration of life is also likened to a flower that withers. Job 14 verse 1 Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. That's real encouraging. But Job is having a bad day, okay? He's having some bad days. Let's give him a break here. He calms out like a flower and withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. Psalm 102, I wither away like grass. So what's the point in our time together this morning? The point is this. There's great profit and pondering our end. There is a God-appointed beginning, a God-appointed end, and at best, everything in between is short, vapor-like, shadow-like, fast-runner-like, fading flower-like, breath-like. Therefore, if we're not going to waste that which is in between. We must commit ourselves to not wasting that which is in between. And as we go from chapel today, my goal is to use this as a foundation. And then we come back tomorrow. And then we begin to talk about practical implications of living in light of the brevity of life. And you know what? I don't have to make them up. I don't have to take stabs in the dark. Scripture over and over again, not only points us to these raw realities. I've just simply stated the facts. Life has a God-appointed beginning and a God-appointed ending, and everything in between is at its best short. But now we're going to find tomorrow that in Scripture, we are told over and over again how that should affect the way we live. And in that soil tomorrow, we're going to seek the plants and seeds and see if God might be calling some of you to use your one short, vapor-like life to live out the gospel for the glory of God where most of our people in our world are. And that you would even begin now in this thriving, growing Tampa Bay metro area. Begin to use your minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years to display the glory of God through the gospel in this 
very, very brief vapor like life you have. May God help us. We are at His mercy. I point you once again to the quote from Matthew Henry and let these words drive us as we depart. The living know that they shall die. But few care for thinking of death. We have therefore need to pray that God by His grace would conquer the aversion which is in our corrupt hearts and cause of death. When we look upon death as a thing at the distance, we are tempted to adjourn the necessary preparations for it. But when we consider how short life is, we shall see ourselves concerned to do what our hands find to do, not only with all our might, but with all possible expedition. Let's pray and ask God to do this in our hearts. Our God, we pause now first to thank you for giving us life. Not only to give us life, but then by your grace to give us spiritual life. We profess here as your people to be born again to have experienced the second birth. And through that second birth, you have awakened within our hearts affections to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. And, oh God, we pray that this work of grace that you've done in our lives to save us would compel us and motivate us to use this one short, vapor-like life for your glory. God, help us to begin by not wasting today. Help us to begin by not only doing what our hand finds to do with all of our might, but today, may we do what our hand finds to do with all possible expedition so that through those things, you might receive all the glory. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.